also do a fun science slash art experiment. Um, this is kind of a famous one on the internet. If you Google crayons and hair dryers art, it's this fun thing where people put crayons along the top of a poster board, shoot a hair dryer at it, and watch it drip down. You know, you can talk about heat and melting points and solids and liquids. You can talk about matter, right? Solid states of matter. Day five. Maybe you, if you want to do a day five, you could read the book again and just do some art based on Harold and the Purple Crayon. Okay, you can see there's a lot of flexibility here. Make it your own. Although I did buy some of the traditional five in a row books. Eventually, I got away from using their books because I wanted to do something more thematic. So for instance, if you think about it as a theme for a month, let me show you. Oh, I, one other point. The great thing about five in a row is that it helps children connect what they're learning to how they would use it in real life. So for instance, math is no longer this abstract concept. It's a way to count their crayons. You know, science is no longer abstract con concept. It's a way to question things that they're reading. Like, oh, the moon, what is the moon? How does the moon move? It allows them to connect to the real world. And so that's what I love about it. Plus it's just, it gives you an instant curriculum that you can easily implement. Okay, so let's talk about themes. So if you go to my blog post, I posted this calendar. And I, what I ended up doing with five in a row was I liked to pick a theme for the month and then I would pick books for that month around the theme. The theme was always either a time period or a country. So April 2017 was Renaissance England. And the reason it was Renaissance England was because the Renaissance Fair comes to town, comes to our town in April and May. And so it was a fun way to lead up to the Renaissance Fair and the kids really enjoyed that. And when I say the kids, at this time, I was kind of co-op homeschooling with a few other families. So there were four kids, four kids. And this was the calendar I made for all of us. So what I did was you can see, let me put down this device. You can see here, theme, um, Elizabethan England, Notable people, Elizabeth I and Shakespeare, movement ideas, Volta and Maypole dances, which are dances that you could look up on YouTube. YouTube has great resources for arts and movement and that sort of thing. I do wanna say it's not a safe place. It's not well monitored for kids. So don't let them go on there without your supervision, okay? But you could learn those sorts of things. And then I, put, I picked one, two, three, four books all around this theme. And then that was the five in a row. So we read The Duchess Bakes a Cake, which is actually one of the true five in a row books. And then we did language arts this day. We did social studies, which always was food because <laughs> me, <laughs> we always, I always did food. And then we would do math and we would do social science and we'd have a field trip, right? So we would make a trip to a fabric store to make a Renaissance headdress. We did an egg hunt, because it was Easter time, then the Renaissance fair, then we did play date planning for next month. And you see, I w picked four books that all had to do with Elizabeth in England. And then I picked four recipes. And here are the recipe links down here. The first one was lemon yeast cake. Now, it's interesting because there's a lot of food that is science related. So back in Elizabethan time, they didn't use baking soda and baking powder to lighten their baked goods. They used yeast. So that was something we got to talk about. It changes the flavor, it's different science. It takes a little bit longer to react than baking soda, different chemical reaction. So think about things you know holistically like that. Then we just did regular bread. We did baked apples. You know, we got to talk a lot about how they, food wasn't as abundant as it is nowadays. And so something like app sugar was really hard to get. And so baked apples was actually a legitimate dessert back then. Um, and then we talked about herbal remedies for stomach. Now the herbal remedies in Elizabethan time were kind of scary. So I, I, I explained to them, I was like, we don't really actually want to use their remedies, but I'm going to explain to you some herbal remedies. And these were the links that I used to talk about these things. So hopefully that makes sense on how to use a calendar like that. 
you know, so I would just, for instance, like maybe you could also pick other themes, right? Like during an election year, you could do, we did, a, at one time we did Revolutionary America, right? And we picked all books having to do with, you know, Benjamin Franklin and Boston Tea Party and that sort of thing. Uh, you know, you could like make soap and make candles as part of your social studies. Lots of fun things you can do when you pick themes. I didn't start with this. I just started with the basic concept of five in a row and then it eventually turned into this because of my own interest. So make it your own. You have the flexibility to do it, embrace it and do it. And one thing that someone asked me, she said that she felt like she was afraid that she didn't know enough to teach her kids. And I would say, look, there's so many resources online. Go to the blog posts, like for instance, Khan Academy is a great one. It's all about providing free education for whoever wants it on the internet. If you don't remember how to do mixed numbers, you can easily watch a video on mixed numbers. Uh, one thing that I loved YouTube for was my child was having difficulty memorizing her multiplication tables, but she has a great ear for music. And when I went to YouTube, this is a link on my blog post, I found a great multiplication table song that is completely how she memorized multiplication tables. Okay, tips on keeping your sanity. <laughs> Remember that boredom is the gateway to creativity. Your child needs to get bored in order to get creative. There have been times when my child absolutely astounds me with the things she does. She actually, one Sunday, not too long ago, a couple weeks ago, she spent almost four hours, a Sunday, right? She didn't have to do any schoolwork. Almost four hours looking at plant parts under a microscope because she was bored and she had to find something to do. You know, making slime, if you have white glue around, making slime is actually a really fun science experiment and then the kid can play with the slime forever. There's lots of tutorials on how to make slime on the internet. So your kid will do amazing things in order to relieve their own boredom. So don't feel like it's your job to entertain your children. Empower them to entertain themselves. Remember that anything can be turned into a lesson. When the International Space Station came across our skies the other day, that became science that night and the next day. We skipped the science textbook that I usually use. Remember that when people have fun, they actually learn more because there's a chemical that's released called dopamine. And it actually is the chemical that is helpful in storing information. I'm sure we all sat through really boring lectures in school and wondered, oh my gosh, the class is over. I don't remember anything <laughs> that I just learned. So think about how you can make it fun for your child. When I was first doing simple addition and subtraction with my child, it became very clear that she was not getting the mathematical equations. But when I brought in physical objects like blocks, it became fun for her and now she's great at math. So one thing that I do with my kid whenever we have to do something that she doesn't really wanna do is I say, look, this lesson can be short and sweet or it can be long and painful, you choose. And of course she picks short and sweet. And what I find is that I think that short and frequent repetition is actually more meaningful than long and infrequent. So my child practices piano for 15 to 20 minutes most days, not one hour twice a week. And it works for us. Focus on what you think is important for your kid to take away. So for instance, this comes up a lot with social studies and science. There's a lot of stuff that's just memorization. I'm not gonna make my child memorize the state capitals. Is it important that she understands what a state capital is and why it exists? I think so. So she understands the philosophy behind state capitals, but I'm not gonna make her memorize them. Same thing with, this came up with balance of powers and our, you know, our represent, representative democracy, the structure of it. It's not important to me that she remember how long the president, the Supreme Court justices and the legislators, how long they're in office, because it's all different time periods. But what is important to me, I think, is that she understand the philosophy behind why the president actually has the shortest amount of time that he or she can serve. And talking about, 
you know, why we have two houses of Congress in order to balance influence among the states. I think that's important. I don't think it's important that she just memorize random things. So think about that. Have your kids help you, tip number, what is this? Tip number four of five. Have your kids help you come up with the schedule. Tell your kids, hey, we have to fit in whatever, however many hours is, one, two, three, four hours. What time would you like to start? What time would you like to finish? What other things would you like to do? Help them come up with the schedule and they'll be more, they'll buy into it more. And know <laughs> that homeschooling is the ultimate practice in not quitting. There was a week in February, feels like a million years ago, I don't know if it was February or January, where literally every single day of that week, I was like, this is not working, I wanna quit. But the fact is, is I really believe in the benefits of homeschooling for my kid. I already told you about the brain science around waking up late. One of the other reasons I really believe in homeschooling is the book Nature, Nurture Shock. And the Nurture Shock is a great book. Each chapter is standalone. One of the chapters was about why teenagers lie. And it was basically about peer groups and how, you know, teens want to mimic whoever they're spending the most time with. And what I had seen was that in kids who homeschool, they seem to have much stronger relationships with their parents because the parents were the primary, maybe not peer in terms of age, but they were the primary social group for that kid. And I felt like that was something that really spoke to me. So that's why I don't give up because I see how my child is thriving and honestly, she wants to homeschool. I've asked, I've always said to her, if you ever want to go to a radio school, let me know. We'll sign you up. She actually really enjoys homeschooling. So the rest of my blog post is really all about resources. There are so many resources online. I have no idea what it was like homeschooling before the internet, but there are, if you need something, trust me, it is out there. There are workbooks, there are websites that are free. There are some that are paid. We use a great typing website, you know, there's, that's free, free language websites. And if you type into a search engine, free homeschooling worksheets, you will be astounded at how much information there is out there. And right now I'm just gonna show you a little worksheet that I put together. This is a math worksheet that I put together because again, I just find that short frequent rep repetition helps my child to learn more than just focusing on telling time one day and then not talking about it for a week. You know, when we were doing that, because some of the workbooks, that's how they were set up. It was like there would be a whole page on time and then there would be nothing on time for many days and she wasn't keeping that information in her head. So I created this little worksheet which basically has one time problem, one addition problem, one subtraction problem, an addition problem that all has to do with counting money uh, make up your own word problem and again depending on your child's age it could be a one-step word problem or a two-step word problem and then some simple multiplication using die right so the plural of dice is die I just put that up there just in case so using die to do multiplication and then showing the relationship between multiplication and addition by writing out the equation and I'm going to show you how to use this and then using geometric shapes for fractions. This first part, oops, that's not the first part. This first part, and by the way, I would always have my child.